Okay, so the point here here is that this is kind of an illustration of the way in which God hides his face. Okay, Joseph went out. He was so overcome with emotion at seeing his younger brother that he went in the back room to weep. Okay, so here's a link for a page on my site where it talks about hiding the face. So you can go there and find a lot more examples and verses having to do with hiding the face. So again, could it be that at the second coming, Jesus is weeping? Amen. After the dinner, back to this Joseph story, he sends them on their way, but he had them stopped. They're just heading out with their donkeys and their loads of grain. And he tested them by hiding his cup in, or having his cup hidden in Benjamin's sack. He wanted to test to see if they had really changed their attitude or not. So let's read Genesis 44, 12. That's Michael. And he searched and began at the eldest and mm -hmm. left at the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Okay. Uh, Paul, if you could read Genesis 44, 33, please. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the lad as a slave to my Lord. And let the lad go up with his brothers. Okay, so this is Judah speaking, the one who just offered to stay as a slave in Benjamin's place, which is pretty noble of him, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What What is significant about the fact that it was Judah who did that among all the brothers? Because Jesus was from the tribe of Judah, and he took our place. Right, so Judah was kind of a prefiguring Christ's self-sacrificial attitude, we can say. Okay, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to continue to show just a bit more here. Now it gets, there's a kind of a dramatic scene in here that's not mentioned in the Bible, but this is a movie after all. <laughs> He's about to reveal yeah. himself to his brothers. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it is a very good movie. It's, it's been, quite uh, accurate, actually. Except for that little part. Well, they added it, it's a movie. <laughs> um, let me get back here okay a couple of things when they had that little standoff there that were mentioned um, I guess as Levi said we'd rather die a thousand deaths than see such pain in our father's eyes again and another brother loves, says or live another 20 years of wretched, wretched cowardice and the point here is the effect of the pain of guilt and, as Levi said, mm -hmm. wretchedness. Okay. Fortunately, in this story, they were repentant, and it all turned out good. Okay. <laughs> but do you think about this. Do you suppose they, those brothers, even had the knowledge of the true character of God that we have? Probably not. Probably not. They probably understood wrath of God as most people do today. Mm -hmm. And we're fortunate to have a, a better understanding of that and many other words. What about people at the second coming? The lost. Will they have a true no a knowledge of the true character of God? At one time they did. They had the opportunity. They had to because then they could say, oh, I never had a choice. What kind of God is that? He's unfair. He's going he's gonna to let me go without having an opportunity to know what he's really like. So we're, they had the opportunity somehow. Yeah, we're, we're told that uh, the opportunity will be there for everyone. Yes. The knowledge yeah. of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea, or some verse like that. Doesn't mean people will accept it, as Gary right. is saying, but they will have opportunity. Right. Uh, okay, now we're going to look at fire at the second coming. What about the fire at the second coming? Aren't people going to burn if there's lots of fire like that? Let's look at some verses here. Second Thessalonians 1, 7, and 8. Thomas, please. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Yahshua shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God 
and them <clears throat> and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Yasha Hamashiach. Okay, so what we're kind of doing in this study is showing how a number of words will come into an understanding of what we're looking at. And you need, without going into great detail on any one of them, you need to understand all these words correctly, including vengeance. And here's a verse that explains about vengeance, Deuteronomy 32, 35, Axel. Deuteronomy 32, 35. Um, to me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time. And, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. Okay. What is that verse saying? Yeah, that's why I asked my question. When you see this kind of construction, it is frequent in the Hebrew. To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. And there's a semicolon. And then there's another part that kind of explains the first part of the verse. Okay, so how would you explain, based on this verse, the meaning of vengeance? Is it is it that God is taking on is speaking our language, our our interpretation of who He is? Our, should I say our incorrect interpretation of who He is? Is is that the language that He's He's speaking so that we may he does understand. That. I don't know if I'm I'm, I'm making yeah. sense. Here. He does that, That's what I'm thinking. He All does right. that frequently because, and the Bible is written that way, especially the Old Testament. It, he wants us to overcome our sins and make them right. But before that, we have to recognize that we are sinners, that we have sin. So often the Bible is written in a way to show us our sins. Okay. In this case, what it's doing is explaining. Well, let me ask, what does recompense mean? I should have got a definition on that. It's kind of like, did you say payback? Pay yeah. Okay. Payback. payback is exactly, exactly the word I was thinking of. So the payback in this case is their foot shall slide in due time. Their calamity is at hand. Yeah. So it's a way of saying natural consequences. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you, it's like if you live by the sword, there's a good chance you'll die by the sword or some violent means. Yeah. Or, or you reap what you sow. Oh. So, yeah. yeah. So God's vengeance, in a way, is just allowing the natural consequences of our actions, even <clears throat> bad consequences, to happen. It's just another way of honoring free will, essentially. So, again, there's a whole page here, uh, vengeance definition, that goes into a lot more detail with examples of, of vengeance, like you read what you sow in other verses. Okay, so let's... Continue. We're looking at fire here. Um, Revelation 14.10. That would be Dorothy, please. 14.10. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Okay. See, this this tells us that God is really angry and he's acting uh, in anger, okay. like like it, the this Thessalonians that we just read. Yeah, it tells us that with a surface reading, <clears throat> but remember, we looked at the definition of wrath of God and found the pattern of which I have 70 examples on that one page, and there's probably many, many more. So the wrath of God needs to be properly understood. Okay. Can I have like a comment? Yeah. The uh, wine of the wrath of God. Now, we understand, or we're at least coming into a growing and better understanding of God's character and, and the meaning of wrath as it's as we usually think of God, you know. But, the wine uh, that to me that wine there that it's talking about is the new wine that Jesus talked about, and part of the new wine is what an understanding of the correct understanding 
of the wrath of God, which is defined right after it's mentioned. The wine of the wrath, that's the new wine. The, the, the bad wine is yeah he's really angry and he's gonna he's gonna tear you limb from limb yeah, yeah that's okay. kind of sounds like that yeah yeah Does that make was, sense? can we apply that there you think i think so yeah. i really do um <clears throat> so Which I don't blame him. on this I really don't blame him. as being you know un, unmixed where it's not mixed with mercy but there's no mercy in this when you look at that, but we know that God is merciful, and that wine is again an offering. This is what I'm like. Yes, I'm kind and gentle. Mm -hmm. And they yes. don't want it still, right? Yeah, yeah. That's that's tasty wine, there, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And actually, the word wine, I don't have that in the glossary, but I think it's often equated with doctrine. Doctrine, yeah. Okay, mm. so there's. Uh, God's wine, and then there's the wine of Babylon. Um, okay, for poured out without mixture, without mixture means what? Here's what I put. It's full uh, strength. No I put no dilution. Okay? No so it's the full-on wrath of God, but it's not the no mercy type. Remember, the wrath of God is him weeping at what we're doing. Yeah. And it's him honoring free will and stepping back in order to allow us to have our way. And in this case, you know, Revelation 14, we're talking second coming and associated events here. Um, he is totally honoring free will. He's not going to mess with us anymore in terms of imposing his will in any way. Um, it says, tormented with fire and brimstone. Okay. Fire is another word that's greatly misunderstood. Now, just to be clear, many of these words can have a different meaning when they're used in association with God as opposed to used in association with man. Yeah. Okay? Um, so it's like the verse we read, the wrath of God worketh not the righteousness of, the man, of man. It's telling us God's wrath is different than man's wrath. So God's fire might be different than our fire. Let's read Revelation 19, 12, Evans. His eyes were a stream of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name breathed, that is, that no man knew that he Okay, thank you. you. You faded out quite a bit there, but we've got it on the screen. So, his eyes were a flame of fire. We sometimes use the expression <clears throat> when we're talking about strong emotion in someone, you could see it in his eyes. Right? You heard that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When we do that, what, what is the it? You can see it in his eyes. Now, I kind of already the, said The it. pain or the... Uh, disappointment or something. Yeah, the, the emotion, the, the pain emotion. or disappointment, or it could be anger, wrath, any of those it things. It could be love. It could be love. And I think in this case, his eyes were a flame of fire, could be saying, his, from his eyes, from his expression, he's exhibiting only love. Mm -hmm. Okay, is that possible? Absolutely. He can't exhibit anything else. He can't exhibit anything else. If fire used of God's actions is love, then that's what that would mean. Okay, now let's go to Song of Solomon 8 and verse 6, and that's Gary, please. I would have to say, early on, this was one of those verses that began to turn me and my understanding right here. Okay. Okay, set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is as strong as death, jealousy as cruel as the grave, its flames are flames of fire, and most vehement flame. Okay. So, do you like to expand on that? You said that was a good verse for you. Yes. Uh, actually, I heard uh, an Adventist guy named Ty Gibson that used this correctly, you know, as as far as leading me. He, uh, he said, you know, this, this, this fire oftentimes in the Bible is a symbol for God's love. 
And I thought about that and I thought about that. And then as I began to understand more from Adrian and other people, then it began to make sense. It began to make sense. Then I thought of fire. His eyes are like fire. Well, there's a campfire. Nice, warm, warming, soothing. You know, it, it draws you there, the warmth of it. And so it, it's kind of also of a picture of the heart of God, loving, accepting, warming, soothing, comforting. Yeah. There's that kind of fire. Then the other kind of fire, of course, <laughs> that we typically think of a raging fire that destroys. Yes. Okay, good. Okay, uh, so fire can have a totally different meaning. Mm -hmm. Let's read Exodus 3, 2, uh, Judy. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Okay, so this fire happened in association with God's presence. Mm -hmm. And since the bush was not consumed, God's presence is not destructive. It didn't burn up the bush. Okay, there's a clue there. Uh, Romans 12, 20, Michael. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him a drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Okay, coals of fire. What what do the coals of fire mean in that verse? What is the function of the coals? It's going to bring a con it should bring a conviction Maybe. to them that they've been behaving, you know, what their behavior is really like. But you're showing them love. Okay, showing them love. I put showing love to stir up the conscience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That so, would make your enemy feel bad <laughs> if yeah, you treat him nicely. Yeah, not that you want him to feel bad. No, but you want to treat him, love, you know, love him anyway. Yeah, you're saying showing love, and that's to give him a drink. You're doing something good. It's kind of in contrast to their actions towards you, perhaps, and it should stir up the conscience. And that is maybe what's going on in the second coming uh, situation, even. So that helps us with the meaning of fire. Again, here's a link to that page. So is Yeshua coming with physical fire? Can I, can I read a verse that kind of... Uh... Shed some light. Okay, which verse? It's uh, Second Thessalonians uh, nine or eight. I'm sorry, eight. No, not Second Thessalonians. Only four, three chapters. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of His mouth, which is probably His word, and destroy with the brightness of His coming. It's two verse eight. <clears throat> Two verses. Okay. Okay. Um, does that make it sound like his coming with physical fire? You say no. No, it's just the brightness of his coming. <laughs> and his breath. The breath of his mouth. The breath of his mouth. Oh, what comes out of his mouth? The word. Word. Yeah. yeah. And what words would Yeshua speak? Words of love. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. The other thing in Revelation 14, the verse we were going over, um, where, it, where it talks about brimstone, that could be supreme divinity. Okay, we're going to look at brimstone in a minute. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I would say that no, Jesus is not coming with physical fire. And, you know, I've also got on my list for the glossary the word brightness, the word brightness, okay? Destroy with the brightness of his coming. I don't think that's a, a light so bright that a person dies. The brightness is an exhibition of his character. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it destroys in the sense, same kind of sense that these people want the rocks and mountains to fall on. They're overcome with guilt when they see the full revelation of his brightness of his character. Yeah, they're going to know that they they were following false gods and and they were denying the true God, yes. and now it's going to be right in front of them. <laughs> right. So is he trying to somehow kill the lost with guilt? No. He's trying to bring them to repentance, mm -hmm. isn't he? Um, so in here, <clears throat> this is my 
booklet on um, the Lake of Fire and the Second Death. Oops. There's a section here that um, describes the experience of the lost in the lake of fire. And many people will envision it like this, that you know God's got you in his hand, he can squish you like a bug and he's got this big finger pointing at you. Um, but that's not the way it is at all. And this lake of fire is really, um, is certainly not as is normally understood. There's no fire involved at that point. <clears throat> fire will burn up the dead corpses later, true. Okay, so just a reference. You can find more in that booklet if you want, and there's a link to it. So let's look at the meaning of brimstone. And again, that's on my list, but there's no page written on it yet. Brimstone actually just means the presence of God. Okay, I'm just... Okay, I may not have put the verses in here. But if you find verses on brimstone, find the Strong's numbers and look it up. It comes from a word that just means God. It's his presence. And here's a quotation I'd like to read. It says, The sight of the inexpressible glory of the Son of God, this is talking about the second coming, will be intensely painful. So the sight is painful to those whose characters are stained with sin. A pure light and glory emanating from Christ, thus this brightness we're talking about, will awaken remorse, shame, and terror. They will send forth wails of anguish to the rocks and mountains, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Okay, so it's seeing the glory or character that is painful to them and causes that reaction. So here's another page on the word glory. More about that. And let's read these verses. Psalm 34, 21. That's Paul, please. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. Okay. So just to point out that what kills the wicked, what slays them in the end is evil. And God is certainly not evil. So we've got to look somewhere else for their death. Hey, their own behavior basically mm -hmm. you reap what you sow okay thomas please hebrews 7 26 um, i'm not seeing that on the screen oh there it is okay for such a high priest became us who is holy harmless undefiled separate from sinners and made higher than the heavens Okay, so that's maybe not proof of anything, but it's one more piece of evidence. If his harmless, he's not going to harm anyone, right? Okay, uh, Luke 7, 34, Axel. No, Luke 7, 34, the Son of Man is come eating and drinking, and ye say, behold, a gluttonous man and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, Okay, what do you think are the thoughts of the people saying that in Luke 7, 34? <clears throat> We're better than those publicans and sinners. <laughs> yeah, they could be saying that for sure. Anything else? They don't understand grace. No, they don't understand grace. Could they also be thinking that he should be punishing them? Yes. Or they should be punished at some point. Okay. I shouldn't have anything to do with them because they're just publicans and sinners. Yeah, but those just happen to be the ones that, that Yeshua came to save. That's right. <laughs> yeah, he came to save sinners. <clears throat> okay, Psalm 120, verses 3 and 4, uh, Dorothy. And this is from the remedy. Uh, what will the Lord do to you who practice deceit and prefer lies? For your conscience will be pierced by the arrows of your own lies and your characters charred like burning coals of a dry tree. Okay. What will the Lord do to you? Then, then it answers the question and says, your consciences will be pierced. So it's them doing it to themselves, really. 
pierced by arrows. And I could have put the link in here. You can find it in the glossary. The word arrows um, is used for conviction of conscience in quite a few places, even in, in the Old Testament. Okay. Um, okay, we're going to look at another quick topic here. There's actually another possibility for fire the fire and upheaval of everything that's happening in nature at the second coming. It's actually the earth itself reacting. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's read Psalm 50 and verse three, uh, Evans. Uh, are you there, Evans? Psalm 50 and verse three. Say it again. Evans, do you have Psalm 50 and verse 3? Oh. Okay. Psalms. You say Psalms? Oh. Okay. Yeah, Psalm 50 and verse 3. Can you see that? Okay. Our word shall come. It shall not keep silence. A fire shall Okay, thank you. Sounds like the audio is not real good at your end. Um, so there will be a fire devouring before him. So it's, there's fire. Um, another verse, Psalm 97 and verse 3. Okay. A fire goes before him and burns up his enemies round about. Okay. Yikes. Um, okay. This will help us with that understanding. First Kings 19, 9, uh, Judy. And there he went into a cave and spent the night there in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Okay, and he came, so that's Elijah coming to this cave. What happened shortly before this? Why was Elijah showing up at that cave? Because Jezebel threatened to kill him. Okay, Jezebel threatened to kill him after this Mount Carmel episode with the prophets of Baal and all that. He ran for his life and ended up at this cave. And God asked him, what are you doing here? And his answer um, in the very next verse, uh, Michael. First Kings 19.10, sorry. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, they have thrown down thy elders, they have slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Okay, so what was in Elijah's mind at this point? What was he thinking about? What he had gone through? And no, what was the truth? What was me? Okay. Mm. Anything else? He was probably feeling okay. guilty for all the blood he shed. Okay. Yeah. It's uh, yeah. kind of an intense thing to run a sword through 450 people. PTSD. PTSD, yeah. Um, he mentions, they have slain thy prophets with the sword. Elijah was a prophet of God, right? So might these prophets have been his friends? Some of them? Yeah. yeah. So the prophets of Baal, not particularly friendly. Right? No, but he says, have slain thy prophets. Well, that's true sort. Prophets. He's talking about true prophets. There. Yeah. Yeah. So what was in Elijah's mind was feelings of vengeance, feelings of guilt, PTSD. I mean, he just run for many miles and He's got to be pretty stirred up, right? Mm. So he comes to this cave, and then let's read verses 11 to 13. Paul, please. Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, 
a delicate whispering voice. Okay, good. Uh, one more verse. Oh. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Okay, so God was asking him <laughs> questions like this. What are you doing here, Elijah? It wasn't a loud, demanding voice. It was a still, small voice. Okay, so what was the cause of the wind, the earthquake, and the fire? Remember, it says God was not in them. It would seem reasonable that could mean he was not responsible for them. He didn't bring them about. What Elijah was, was responsible. Elijah was responsible. Could Elijah cause an earthquake? The earth was yes. reacting. Okay, the earth was reacting to what? All the blood. Okay, all the blood and all these strong emotions in Elijah, maybe? That's the way I've heard it presented. And when you study, um, and I've got the link here for the definition of curse. When you look at that, and I could have also, oh, I did put it here, dominion. <coughs> when you look at those things, it becomes apparent that the earth actually can and does react to man's emotions and activities and things. Okay. Another example of this right from the beginning in Genesis 4.11. Uh, Thomas, please, Genesis 4.11. Now, art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand? Okay, so Cain's killing of his brother caused a reaction in the earth. Okay. And we could look at that a lot more. Um, okay, I see I had this quote in here twice. We already, already read that. So how then do we understand the meaning of a lamb as in character? What's his uh, Peaceful. Peaceful, lamb-like character is peaceful. Loving. Loving, okay. He's a, a lamb is a grass-eating vegetarian animal, unlike a lion, a bear, and a leopard that requires blood, which is a symbol for the penal legal view that God demands blood from. And so there's a difference there. Okay. Why okay. he's a lamb and the other nations or peoples are described as blood-sucking vampires that require the death of somebody else in order to sustain their life. Yeah, that's it's their spiritual. idea of justice. Yeah. 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 Here, here's a diagram I've got on my, uh, if you go to my homepage, there's a link for diagrams. And I have on one page collected a lot of the major di diagrams we use in our studies. And in this case, it's talking about understanding the subject of the Old Testament. In the normal viewpoint, this is the discerner, the reader of the Old Testament, through the common viewpoint when reading the Old Testament, they see and understand God as killing, wrathful, vengeful. But, so that's the lion. In the lamb, at the other end, when you look at or read the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament, through Yeshua's life, you will see God allowing consequences, not actively punishing. He accommodates our wishes he honors our free will okay it's quite a different picture when you get that you get when you look using a different lens okay notice this guy has a frown on his face and this guy has a smile i just turned the frown upside down to get that so what was the purpose of the israelites taking a lamb four days before the passover taking it into their house to get to know it and to love it yeah okay get to know it and love it and to show them it was an object lesson in a sense to show them the character of the one protecting them okay because it was the blood of the lamb on the doorposts that would protect them mm -hmm. in the case of the egyptian plague there so here's a question i i think that comes from what we've looked at and this is just an initial look at it might Yeshua come even the second time as a lamb? Oh, yeah. Of course. 
Yes, of course, he doesn't change. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. that, that is so different, though, than how we usually envision him coming. And this brings up this mirror principle, which we've touched on but not looked at too much. There's much in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, to show us our own character, our own sinfulness. Um, you know, we need to have our need pointed out to us because we have a terminal disease and we need a cure for it. And there is a book, Adrian is writing a book to come out soon on the mirror principle. So we're, we're waiting for that. Um, and part of the point of this whole presentation was that there's a number of terms that must be correctly understood um, and at the same time for a correct understanding. So in order to understand a little more about the meaning of lion, we've looked at lion, wrath, face, vengeance, fire, brimstone, glory, curse, dominion, and lamb, all those words. Uh, you kind of have to have a correct understanding in each one, for each one. And that's what makes it difficult for so many people. You know, there's going to be fire at the second coming. Well, they understand vengeance in a certain way, and a lion, lion of the tribe of Judah in a certain way. They understand wrath in a certain way. It makes it hard to get a correct understanding of what's going on unless you kind of have all these words. Yeah. And that's kind of the purpose of this glossary, which we've been building for the last two or three years. And now we're putting it into use a little bit more. Okay, we're looking at examples of some of these things. And it's proven to be helpful, I think, to have a correct understanding. Um, okay, we're going to finish with this passage. 2 Corinthians 2, 14 and 16. Before Axel reads that, can I? Yeah, go ahead, Paul. You, you asked um, if Yeshua, when he comes, will he be coming as a lamb? Um, in Revelation 14, 1, there's a verse that says, um, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And that's... Uh, and we were going over verse 10 about the, uh, the fire and the brimstone. <clears throat> so this is before that. Yep. And so there he is as a lamb on Mount Zion. Okay. And actually, an interesting thought from that, too. <clears throat> we know that the lamb, Yeshua, represented his father's character. Mm -hmm. It's described here as a lamb. And it says the 144,000 having this father's name or character written in their, their foreheads, yeah. which suggests pretty strongly that they have the same character. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they might be going around. I understand the 144,000 will have a message for people on earth before the end, but it won't be one of fire and vengeance. It'll be appeals to their consciences, uh, pointing out to them the Messiah and their need to make a change. Okay, so Axel, go ahead with that last passage there. Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians two, verse fourteen and sixteen. 14 to sixteen. Um, what it? Why does it differ to? Mine differs to what you have here. You have, but their minds were blinded. Uh, what version are you reading? I'm reading the King James, and it says, "Now thanks be to God." Oh, thanks be unto God. Maybe it's second Corinthians. Maybe it's which Corinthians? Okay. Anyway, what's on the screen is what I want. I may have. Okay. All right. I'll read from the screen then. Okay. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. No, first. Which veil is done away in Christ? But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when when it anyone shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Wow, I've never read this text with that understanding. Okay, that's it's chapter three. It's yes. a very important verse, and it's very it, refreshing. Yeah, it totally goes with this diagram up here. Okay, just keep that in mind. I need to <clears throat> this. There, there's a veil over the mind, and that veil is a misunderstanding of the character of God. And 
that causes a lot of confusion when reading the Old Testament. In Christ, <clears throat> in a recognition, a knowledge of his character, that veil is taken away because of how he lived and because of knowing that he represented his father's character. Therefore, when you read anything in the Old Testament, and there's lots of it, that does not line up with the character of a loving God, then you need to investigate further. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that veil is taken away when anyone turns to the Lord with an open mind and a desire to know truth. Okay? We will stop there. Any comments or questions? That was good, Ray. Okay, let me... Uh...